Okay. All right. We're ready to start. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. O heavenly comfort, the spirit of truth, who are present and fills all things, treasury of good things, and giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, a good one. Amen. Amen. So hopefully this week the audio is working for the um, live stream. It looks like it is. Um, last week the audio didn't work, but the video did, so we deleted the file. So we'll be recording that. Uh, I'll be recording that by myself and then posting it hopefully here in the near future. Um, so tonight we are going to talk about the expansion of Christianity in northern and central Europe um, in the 9th and 10th century. Um, we talked about this somewhat. We, we talked about this last week. The last week's topic was the expansion of the church, um, specifically in the northern and southern Slavic peoples um, around the same time period. So we're moving west now for this lecture to talk about the expansion of Christianity in Central and Northern Europe. Uh, and so we will start with Scandinavia. These are some of my descendants, or some of my ancestors, I should say. Um, and I'm going to read to you about St. Ansgar. Uh, from Father Andrew Lauth's book, The Greek East and Latin West, The Church, 681 to 1071. Um, so this is dealing with the, the, the ex missionizing of the church into the Scandinavian regions. He says, the central figure seems to be St. Ansgar. But this is probably simply because we have his life meaning there's a written life about who St. Ansgar was, written by his successor as Bishop of Hamburg, Bremen, in the late 9th century. Ansgar was born about 800 and became a monk of Corby. There, he very likely read the missionary lives of Martin, Cuthbert, and Boniface. So these were missionaries of Western Europe before him. Um, Martin is St. Martin of Tours. Cuthbert is St. Cuthbert of Great Britain, British Isles, and St. Boniface is the enlightener of the Germans, the Germanic peoples, um, in what is northern Germany. When he was transferred to Corby's daughter house, Corve in Saxony, on its foundation in 822, the memory of these lives doubtless inspired him to continue their work. In 826, Ansgar went to Denmark as a missionary and was able to continue there for a time after the fall of his patron, King Harold Clock. Shortly afterwards, he was invited further north to the people called the Suones in what is now Sweden, in the neighborhood of Stockholm. His missionary work was recognized when he was consecrated first Archbishop of Hamburg and appointed papal legate to all Swedes, Danes, Slavs, and other northern people by Pope Gregory IV in about 832. So we think, when we think of Germany, we think of where Hamburg is, right? This was the furthest kind of northern outpost of Christianity at this time. And so it was the edge. And from there, missionary work was being done north, further into Denmark and Sweden. And so this is why he becomes Archbishop of Hamburg. Um, after 10 years work building on this foundation, Ansgar suffered a setback when Hamburg was sacked by the Danes in 845. A few years later, the see of Hamburg was united with Bremen. Ansgar again began cautiously to continue his mission among the Danes and the Swedes. In 864, Pope Nicholas I confirmed the union of Hamburg and Bremen and approved the missionary endeavor emanating from there. 
following year Ansgar died, and very soon there was little evidence of any fruit of his work in Scandinavia. Ansgar's posthumous fame as apostle of the north is a rather a bid for his patronage of the later Christianization of the Scandinavians than a reflection of the success of his mission. So in some sense, Saint, what St. Saint Ansgar did was he kind of went in and broke the ground. But he didn't, ultimately, what his, his work didn't, in a sense, produce um, a major change in those cultures. He was, he, his work was kind of the, the cutting edge. Um, and the, the majority of Danes and Swedes did not convert in his day. But they came, it, but that came, but rather that came later. Um, partly under the English monks who went to Norway. Um, Siegfried is one of them around the year 1000. Um, and that helped to kind of solidify what St. Ansgar started. Um, what, in a sense, affected the conversion of the, the, of the Scandinavian people um, greatly was the fact that they themselves, these are the people we call the Vikings, um, left their own land. Um, and initially, what, what they did was to raid and pillage and rape and kill uh, wherever they went. Um, and in the process of that, though, as time went on, they started to settle down in specific regions that had already been, in a sense, uh, the church had already established itself there. And so the Vikings who went out were exposed to Christianity. One of their main um, places they liked to uh, sack were monasteries because monasteries at this time kind of were the uh, functioned as banks in a way not in terms of keeping your money per se, but if you had something precious, it was understood that the monastery was a sacred place and you wouldn't violate the grounds of the monastery. And so if you possess something that you wanted to protect um, and you felt like you couldn't protect it, you would get, you would ask the monastery to, in a sense, to guard it for you. And um, so monasteries became kind of um, the bank vault for people. Um, they were not involved in some kind of money lending in any way. They were just a place to store things, basically. But because of that, they were a ripe, ripe target for a pillage. Yeah. So, um, but because of that, and then their settlement amongst Christian people, uh, they were exposed to Christianity gradually. So I'm going to read another section here from Father Andrew Louth that deals with this. He says, The Scandinavians had had long exposure to Christianity, for the Vikings, as they raided and traded, did so largely amongst those who had embraced Christianity. Trading led to settlement, and the Vikings who settled in northern and central England, in Ireland, and Normandy, eventually came to embrace the Christianity of those among whom they settled. But the Vikings who settled maintained links with the, Scandin with the Scandinavia from which they had come. And along these links, knowledge of Christianity and even some Christian practices may well have passed. And as, a political, and as political unions emerged in Scandinavia, Christian inst instruction and Christian initiation could probably be sought quite informally. And for that reason, the names involved have been largely forgotten in terms of who was involved in Christianizing the Scandinavians. Um, to talk of the Christianization of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden is also to risk an anachronistic conception of what was happening. The Denmark that emerged as a Christian nation sometime after the turn of the millennium was rather different from the modern Denmark. Medieval Denmark included the Eastern Islands of the modern country, together with what is now southwestern Sweden, the coastal strip from Gothenburg to Malmo, with its cathedral in Lund. 
Medieval Norway meant the coasts on either side of the Oslo Fjord, and medieval Sweden, the area around Uppsala. There was much more territory that belonged to nothing that could be called a kingdom, and often more than one person who could claim the title of king. The emergence of these nations, in terms of Sweden, Denmark, Norway, of becoming a, a, a nation, is interwoven with the establishment of Christianity. But it is a story of which we can now only catch a glimpse. So these informal connections, you know, where the Vikings settled, they intermarried, they converted through marriage, and then the, the faith spread from that family back into Scandinavia to another relative or a couple relatives, or they went back with their faith and married, and then their spouse, you know, adopted the faith, so forth. They brought a priest with them or something. And it the, the, the Christianization of the Scandinavians, in a sense, occurred much more this way, in this manner. And so, but we don't have accounts of all those, in a sense, numerous, small uh, groups of people converting, right? And then the nations themselves, as they emerged, their emergence as a nation is linked with their becoming Christian. One, because language, again, um, accompanies Christianization. The Swedes, the Danes, the Norway, they didn't have a written language before being Christian. They had um, runes, but that's not a formal written language that we would think of it. Um, it's very simplified uh, way of, so you can't, you know, you don't write sentences in runes. Right? Um, and so a written language comes with their conversion and a national identity, in a sense, instead of just this tribal identity, an identity around a kingdom or a, a larger identity than a tribe, emerges with their Christianization, with their being baptized. So, so that is the, the Scandinavians. Questions? Since many of us have Scandinavian an ancestry. It's really interesting, Father. I never thought about orthodoxy being in those countries, even though they were close to Russia. But when we were in um, Africa, the people from Denmark have huge um, connections with the country, with the orthodox churches in, um, in Africa and are constantly sending missionaries and helpers and charitable, charity hmm. workers and everything. And I couldn't believe it. I just never thought about in the in in the modern our modern period that we live in now, um, Scandinavia, of course, went through the the Reformation. Uh, many of them, most of those countries, embraced Lutheranism, um, and the but the, the and the Lutheranism they embraced uh, became a, a national church, just like the Church of England in a sense. So there's the Church of Sweden, the Church of Norway, Church of Denmark, the King functions like the king of England does as the head, in some sense, of the church. Um, and just like the Church of England, faith in those places has fallen away um, until the mid-20th century, and you had um, immigrants from uh, Russia because of communism, as well as immigration from the Middle East into these areas. Um, who are Orthodox. And the, so the, the Orthodox churches that are now there in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, um, uh, are uh, from those immigrants. But then the native Danes and Swedes and Norwegians have converted themselves. and But they also have had a, a long history of, of evangelism and missionary work um, as uh, Lutherans or evangelical, evangelical Christians. Um, and they bring that kind of zeal with them if when they could convert to orthodoxy. And you see that then, as you said, kind of manifesting itself in you know, orthodox Danes as missionaries in Africa. So, in other places. So, um, such things happen, yeah. So, what was it about Christianity that would help precipitate the formation of a nation? 
or was it just they became Christian about the same time that would happen anyway? Was it that more coincidental? Or was there something about Christianity that caused that to happen? Um, Christianity, um, in terms of the the manner in which it manifested is, is it, it existed um, at this time universally. Okay. There has, you know, we're still in the ninth century. There is no schism. 10th century, there's no schism yet. Um, there's one church throughout all of Eastern and Western Europe. And the, even the idea of what Europe is hasn't even emerged per se. It's emerging, and we'll talk about that actually, but um, so having a single faith that all the people kind of, it's, it's their life is then centered on, the focal point, right? It brings cohesion to a people. Um, but also they had, in a sense, they were in, interacting with the Christian Empire in a sense of the Christian Roman Empire, whether that is in the uh, based out of Constantinople or uh, Charlemagne's empire that claimed, in a sense, the, the to be the continuation of Rome. That was his whole thing. That's why he was crowned Roman emperor in 800. So he claimed to be the continuation of the Roman Empire in the West. Um, and so the, um, the, the tribes, the, these, uh, the barbarian tribes, the Scandinavian tribes and so forth, um, are much more loosely configured, but they then they interact with a king, right? This is not necessarily the same kind of political structure that they, they themselves have. And so, um, Receiving the faith also introduces them to, in a sense, the, the understanding of Roman Roman political structure or royal kind of the the, uh, the structure of a king and the structure of society around a king that many tribes, in a sense, can be united by one king. And therefore, a, a nation can emerge. And so, um, so this is what I, I think you know, these things kind of went together. Yeah, mostly the the language they spoke, and so but then you come and you give a written language to a people that also kind of binds them together, um, and also kind of helps solidify the 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 language itself around a written form, standardizes somewhat the language because there's a written form of it. It's all these things kind of become very like glue that helps hold society together um, and a common, and then the establishment of some kind of common law um, and the tribal leaders become the nobility under a, a common king. They all kind of just stack up together naturally. Um, does it make sense? So, um, and this is then what you see. We've talked about the Bohe Bohemia, the, uh, which is modern day uh, Czech Republic, um, the church of Salzburg was a great missionizing force in the East, East of them. This is Salzburg, Austria, right? Modern day Austria. But at this time there is no Austria, there's no country of Austria. Um, you have German, you know, th this would be part of what we would call East Francia at this time period. The empire, because Charlemagne's empire fractures after his death, it's divided between his three sons. East Francia is one of these. It becomes the dominant political structure or force or kingdom um, in the, the eastern part of what Charlemagne's empire was. The kingdom of France becomes the dominant force in the western part. And it's and as we see, so from and this was the area that this East Francia was would have kind of Salzburg was within this uh, this kingdom, and so it is from there that the converted princes uh, 
Chaitmar, Duke of Karatania, which is southern Austria and northeast Slovenia. Karatania, this kingdom or this principality, was this, this that's where this was. It's this one kingdom incorporated parts of southern Austria and northern Slovenia. Um, also, Pribna, uh, the Slav prince of Moravia, was missionized through Salzburg. And Majmer, prince of Bohemia, this is all in 822. Um, then we jump ahead, since we've already talked about um, Radislav and Cyril and Methodius coming to, to Moravia and the work that they then did. Um, it's then in, we get to our favorite uh, king of a Christmas carol, St. Wenceslas, who went out on the Feast of Stephen when the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. That Christmas carol is about a real historic person, St. Wenceslas. He was born in 907. His father dies in 919. Uh, his father was the king of Moravia. Conflict over who would leave, lead his regency, because he was in his minority. He was too young to rule on his own. Um, there was a bitter, there was a battle between who would lead that between St. Wenceslaus' gra grandmother, St. Ludmila, as we've had many Ukrainians, uh, refugees coming into uh, Topeka. There's been a, uh, a number that are called Mila. Mila is short for Ludmila, this Ludmila. St. Ludmila, the grandmother of St. Wenceslaus, um, she, though, kind of loses the battle. And it's St. Wenceslaus' mother, uh, Dragomira, who runs the kingdom while Wenceslaus is in his minority. St. Ludmilla dies, um, likely as a martyr, um, somewhere around 920, 921. St. Wenceslaus takes the throne in his own right then when he becomes old enough in 924. And he immediately banishes his mother. But because of the death of his grandmother uh, and translates the relics of his grandmother back to Prague and places them in a church there, uh, I think St. Vitus. Uh, around the year uh, 929, he himself is assassinated by his brother, most likely, Boleslav. Wenceslas was a gentle and pious man. He refused to condemn anyone. He closed prisons and the gallows, stopped executions. Um, and for a society that was used to corporal punishment, and now we're kind of getting rid of it, right? Um, it, it led probably to some upheaval or some consternation amongst the other nobles. His brother is the one who gets the blame for his death in um, all the histories for the most part. And I'm going to read to you a little bit about St. Wenceslaus from Father Andrew Lau's book. Um, let's see. So scarcely more than two years after St. Wenceslaus' death, Boleslav had, this is now, he's now king, and he's his brother, who likely had him killed, had his brother's relics which had been already begun to work miracles, brought back to Prague and placed in the church of St. Vitus that had been built by St. Wenceslaus. Wenceslaus became not just the patron saint of Bohemia, he became effectively its heavenly ruler and the gu guarantor of the dynasty to which he belonged. As such, St. Wenceslaus was the main device on royal seals. This phenomenon of the saintly king martyr, um, this phenomenon of a saintly king martyred, but claimed as the protector of his successors, who ah, had often been complicit in his death, is not an unparalleled uh, event in early Middle Ages. England seems to have begun the tradition with the cults of saints Oswald and Edmund. And later, though he was not martyred, St. Edward the Confessor. I don't know if you watched um, King Charles's um, 
enthronement. It was in the, in the throne, in the chair of St. Ed, Edward, the confessor, that he sat. That's the royal throne of England. It is the throne of St. Edward, the confessor, who would, is, would be considered an Orthodox saint. And if you watched it, they, they did a number of kind of camera angles from above, looking down. If, you've, or if you're familiar with Westminster Abbey, you're very much familiar with its gothic feel because you're looking, you know, vertical. But looking down the floor of where the throne sat is Byzantine. Byzantine meaning uh, inspired from Constantinople, inspired from the East, um, because that's how old the church is. It's the foundation, at least. You know, the foundation of the Westminster Abbey is, is old enough that it has, in a sense, it's the floor itself still uh, is old enough that it's it was laid in a time, the foundation was laid in a time when this uh, division, East and West, didn't really exist in such, that the ethos and the character of Christianity permeated from Constantinople and further East all the way to Westminster Abbey. So... Uh, so yeah, the symbols or color in the floor. Or the, the design and pattern of the floor is something you would find anywhere in in Eastern Europe or in the ancient churches of Constantinople or even Mount Athos. I could recognize it because I've been to Mount Athos and at the um, the the, the, the the main church at the monastery of Aviron, um, a bit the same basic pattern is laid out on the floor. It's kind of uh, the way that the kind of pattern of the floor with circles and different things are laid out, kind of intertwined. Um, it's very much, it's uh, very similar. So, and that church that I was at is a thousand, thousand years old, literally. The floor is a thousand years old. So, um, the cult of St. Olaf in Norway is another example. Very close to the example of St. Wenceslaus. In the case of St. Magnus, the martyr of the Orkneys, depicts, depicted in the lies as living a quasi-monastic life, and like Wenceslaus, displaying a gentleness that hardly benefited an early medieval king. So too, with the Russian passion bearers, Boris and Gleb. In the tales, tale of Boris and Gleb, Boris actually recalls the martyrdom of Wenceslas before his own murder. In all these cases, the martyrdom of a saintly king provides his dynasty with heavenly protection. That this was this became a pattern throughout Europe. That the kind of as Christianity um, came into the society and the kings kind of wrestled with becoming Christian and what that meant, there was often a case where one of the kings is killed by a rival because of his faith and he becomes a martyr and then he becomes the in a sense the patron saint of that nation in a sense the nation that killed him in a sense but he becomes their heavenly protector which had been a, a pattern of course going further back um, to the beginning of christianity and beyond and before because you had in a sense heavenly protectors of nations the archangel michael being the archangel that was the archangel to guard and protect the nation of Israel. So a heavenly protector that God, in a sense, assigns, right? This is a pattern going back into the Old Testament. And that continues forward. Um, and St. Wesselsloth being, in a sense, the patron saint of the, the Czechs, what we, what we think of as the Czechs. Um, questions? But this is all still the pattern. This is a, the pattern that, that is, in a sense, is occurring before the schism. Again, this is kind of what is normal at this period. So when the when Armenia was converted, uh, it wasn't. They have they have in a sense saintly kings, but the the for them the one who is the founder of the kind of the patron saint of Armenia is Saint Gregory the Illuminator. He was the in a sense, the one who had been sold into 
slavery, I think it was. In the pit for 15 years. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, he had been confined for many, many years, and but um, he was able to uh, assist the king. And the king was, you know, converted because of the work of this slave. And the same of Georgia, right? The slave Nina, she is the one who becomes the kind of the patron, one of the patron saints of Georgia as kind of the first to missionize. To be, and this follows the pattern of what we were talking about with the Scandinavians, the simple people, right? St. Patrick being similar to this, right? In the sense that he was a slave in Ireland first. And then he left. And but then he was sent back, right? And we have his life written. Well, St. Nina was similar. She was a slave in Georgia. And through her life, um, through her life, she impacted people. And they saw the truth of Christ in her life first before she had to say anything. And the same with St. Gregory. Um, so in some sense... With the kings then, the kings themselves are trying to embrace Christianity and what that means to be a Christian. And they are uh, opposed by their pagan siblings, basically, in most of these examples, um, and give their life, um, in a sense, in the t uh, as opposed to fight for their kingdom. Um, so this sets a pattern. Um, that then, uh, which is basically the same pattern of Christ taking up his cross to die for his people, right? The kings become, you know, they take their cross literally sometimes for their for their people. Uh, but ultimately, that that sacrifice becomes salvific for themselves and as a witness to their own people that then embrace the faith because of their what they did, and they then intercede or. Are the patrons of that nation, um, and nations don't have just one patron saint often, right? Um, in Georgia and Armenia, you have rulers, kings, who then themselves die for their faith, and they are then kind of added to that list of patrons of the nation in a sense from different time periods. Um, it's not just nations, cities too. Thessalonica has like I don't know how many patron saints. So, um, because, you know, St. Paul being one of them, St. Demetrius, the great martyr who died in Thessalonica, um, and then uh, St. Nestor, who was his disciple, died in Thessalonica. Uh, and then, of course, then in the 14th century, St. Gregory Polymas is Archbishop of Thessalonica, and he reposes there. And they're all kind of include. they're all counted as patrons of that city because they all had been there. They all had done work there. They all had cared about the city. So that love and care doesn't, in a sense, end when they die. So people remember them and celebrate their uh, their their memory. Um, and this that's the patterns followed here by Saint Wenceslas um, in what happens after his death. The questions. So then we get to another saint, Saint Adalbert, who we've already kind of touched on because he actually ended up in Moscow in the nine mid to late 900s for a while. But his mission there did not uh, did not have any lasting uh, effect. Um, so again, Father Andrew Louth. My mother's maiden name. Adelbert. Mm -hmm. We'll see why, maybe. Your mother being of German and from Germany, right? Bavaria. Bavaria, yeah. Adelbert was more of an ascetic than a bishop and had been impressed by the ideals of Cluny. Cluny had, was a monastery in France that became extremely uh, influential in the West. Um, if there's time, we'll talk about it. Um, after six difficult years, um, and so Adalbert became the second bishop of Bohemia. Um, 
He was consecrated by the Archbishop of Mainz in 983, but he was more of a ascetic than a bishop and had impressed had been impressed by the ideals of Cluny. After six difficult years, he left for Rome and there became a monk. He returned to Prague briefly and founded a monastery near Prague in 992. Thereafter, relations with Boleslav worsened, and he left for Rome again. In about 995, he visited Hungary, where he baptized Geza in his son, Stephen. This is Stephen, future Saint Stephen, King of Hungary. In his final years, he went to Poland. And from there, he went to convert the Prussians, a Baltic people who were a threat to the Poles uh, on their eastern frontier, where he met a martyr's death. Boleslav of Poland um, had his relics brought to Gnezno, which I know I'm mispronouncing, forgive me, which became the center of his cult or his, the place of his memory. And so St. Al, um, Adalbert, coming from um, Bavaria, sent to Bohemia, but getting having difficulty with the ruler of Bohemia, ends up becoming a monk, establishing a monastery in Prague, but then going to Poland. At one point, though, in the midst of this, the 980s, or the, before the 90s, uh, before, I, can, I don't remember the exact date, but he was also asked to come to, to Moscow by Olga, but that didn't stop, that didn't take root um, at that time, and he went back and then ended up again in Poland. Um, so Father Andrew Laus goes on, he says, despite the links with the Latin church in Germany, Slav was still at least tolerated in the Czech church and remained so throughout the 10th century. This happy state of affairs could not last, and in the course of the 11th century, the Slav tradition was gradually forced out. By the end of the century, the Church of Bohemian was a Latin-speaking church. So the initial work in Slavonic amongst the Bohemians only lasts into the 11th century when Latin is basically imposed on the entirety of the church in Bohemia. Um, Again, from the what is from the the influence of the what we, the empire to the west, which we'll get to here in a little bit, which is the um, what is called the Holy Roman Empire. What, but is the, the is the, uh, the 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 kingdom of East Francia that then enlarges itself. And basically bring several under kingdoms under its authority where you have an emperor over a number of kingdoms. That's what the Holy Roman Empire becomes. Um, but again, it's Latin is its language. So at least for religion. And then we get to the Hungarians or what they, they call themselves the Magyars. Their language is Uralic, is from the Uralic family, which is the same language family as the Finns, the Estonians, and many Central Russian uh, language families of various tribes. And so it is most likely that the Hungarians were people who migrated from the Ural Mountains, the Ural Mountain region of what is uh, modern day Russia. They're first mentioned in Western sources in 862. They were a nomadic people that came from the east. They were the marauding pagan hordes, in a sense. On horseback, able to shoot their, their bows uh, extremely well. They were greatly feared um, by... Um, The Christians, greatly feared, um, just like the Vikings. Um, and so we will read a little bit here. The Christianity seems to have reached the Magyars first from Constantinople, or 
In the 920s, a priest called Gabriel was sent on a mission to them, but we know nothing of, as to his fate. In 948, a chieftain called Bulksu Harka was baptized in Constantinople, his godfather being Constantine Porphyrogenitus, the emperor. He soon apostatized, however. He was one of the leaders hanged at Regensburg after the Magyar defeat at the river of Lech. Another chieftain, Gula, was baptized in Constantinople in 953, and he returned to Hungary with a monk, Hierotheos, who had been consecrated bishop of Turkia by Patriarch Theophilact of Constantinople. Byzantine influence was felt mainly in the eastern part of the country, to the east of the river Tsitsa. In Pannonia and the valley of the Danube, German missionaries were active. Most important among them, a former monk of Reichenau, Wolfgang, who was consecrated Bishop of Regensburg in 973 at the insistence of Pilgrim, Bishop of Pausa from 971 to 991. Um, as the Magyars settled in Pannonian Plain, their leaders turned towards Christianity. Giza was baptized in 995, taking the Christian name of Stephen. A law, although Giza seems to have regarded the Christian God as one, as another one he could afford to add to his pantheon, replying to a bishop who objected, he remarked that he was a rich man and well able to afford sacrifices to all the gods. He seems to have introduced Christianity among his people with some violence. Giza's wife was also reported to have played a role in the conversion. Adalbert, who we've already talked about, was said to have dealt more with her than her husband because, quote, she held the whole kingdom in her hands, unquote. She was reported to be not only beautiful, but a hard drinker and a good writer who had killed a man with her bare hands. Tough lady. Her name was Slav Belenknegnia. Um, and she's referred to as Sorolt, Sorolt in later legends, which means white lady. Though the Polish sources say that Geza married the sister of Ms. Misko I, um, either way, it is possible that um, the white lady was already a Christian when she married Giza and thus promoted Christianity among the Magyars. Giza's son, Vachk, uh, who may have been baptized by Adalbert of Prague, also took Stephen as his baptismal name, meaning Stephen the first martyr. He married Gisela, daughter of the Bavarian Duke Henry II. Well-educated, Stephen accessed, acceded to the throne on the death of his father in 997. In the year 1001, Stephen, like Boleslav of Poland, became part of Otto III's vision of a renewed Christian empire, Otto III being the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, so-called, but being centered in what is modern-day Germany. Stephen received the title of king and a royal crown from the emperor and the pope. The crown is identified with the present holy crown of Hungary. Um, there's a picture in the book of it, I believe. Let's see. Is that... No, sorry. I was wrong. Somebody else's crown. Um, the crown is identified, yes. Um, and this would have been Pope Sylvester II. Its symbolism, material size, jewels, and enamel, and enamel icons, the crown had icons on it, as well as its mystic power, make it a truly remarkable piece of regalia. I think to this day, nobody can touch it. The cross on it is kind of tilted. Nobody will adjust it because it's like it's too holy to touch with your bare hands. He commended himself and his people to the patronage of St. Peter, the apostle, and hung Hungary was granted an arch archbishopric with dependent with dependents bishoprics. So it, like as we have a metropolitan with bishops underneath, that's the same kind of structure. Um, 
The site of the archbishopric was eventually settled in Estergom. Christianization proceeded apace under King Stephen, who was later canonized. He issued law codes that defined the position of the church in the Hungarian society and the practice of religion. Sundays were to be observed and the fasts kept by law. That might strike us a little odd in our American sensibility, but moving from paganism to Christianity was quite the move. A strict justice was imposed with severe penalties. Stephen had none of the qualms that St. Wenceslaus had, and they were both counted as saints. The country was divided into ten dioceses and was to be provided with a network of parishes. A Benedictine convent was founded on the hill of St. Martin, and other monasteries were established throughout his realm. The king himself appointed bishops and abbots. After the defeat of the Bulgarians in the hand, at the hand of the Byzantine emperor, the, this is the, the Roman emperor in Constantinople, Basil II, Stephen transferred his royal see from Estergom to another name, starts with an S, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, um, which is Alba Riga, Re Regia. Um, I guess that's what it, the translation of it is. And he opened the pilgrimage route to the Holy Land through Hungary. Whatever the true situation, the rest of Europe was amazed at the transformation of Hungary into a Christian country. As the chronicle Ralph Glaber put it, the people of the Hungarians who previously were accustomed cruelly to prey upon their neighbors now freely give of their own for the sake of Christ. They who formerly pillaged the Christians now welcome them like brothers and sisters. And that was the Hungarians and their baptism under largely under St. Stephen, king of Hungary. And again, his crown is still the, the national treasure of Hungary. So, um, questions? But they're mostly um, Catholic, Roman Catholic. I think they're split between Catholic and Calvinist. Yeah, I believe so. Um, don't quote me on that. We'll, uh, as we go through, our, we'll, we'll cover, we'll come back to them when we get to the Reformation, Protestant Reformation, kind of all of these areas. We'll kind of co cover again, kind of what then transpires um, in the Protestant Reformation. So then this takes us to the Holy Roman Empire that we've kind of been mentioning. In the 10th century, the Carolingian Empire continued to uh, fragmentate. Powerful nobles who ruled territories um, emerged, and they were as vital, uh, they, were, they were as strong as the king himself in many ways. So the nobles kind of were the equal of the king in many ways. Um, and it was difficult then for the king, in a sense, to keep his nobles under his authority. So in the east part of this empire, the Holy Roman Empire ruled, was ruled by an emperor, elected by the nobility and crowned by the pope. In the west, a French king struggled to assert authority over the nobility under him. The Roman emperor... Uh, Roman emperor was used as a title by Charlemagne and his successors until 924, but then it fought, fell out of use. In 962, Otto I was crowned emperor by Pope John XII. Otto I deposed Pope John XII a year later in 963 and replaced him with Pope Leo VIII. His son, Otto II, reigned from 967 to 983 and married the Roman princess, meaning Roman in Constantinople, princess of Theophanu. Their son, Otto III, takes the actual control of the empire in 994, but he reigns only until 1002, and he dies an early death. The vision of the empire under the, uh, the Ottonian rulers, all those named Otto, was that of multiple kingdoms being under the leadership of one emperor and one pope. 
This came to constitute the kingdom of Germany, the kingdom of Italy, the kingdom of Bohemia, and the kingdom of Burgundy. At, at early on, the kingdom of Hungary was a part of this, but then broke off. Um, and the kingdom of Burgundy. The emperors were chosen by the nobles at first, and then specific nobles who were a member of a college of electors. And there came to be the seven electors by the 14th century. So um, the kingdom, the, the, anybody know how long the Holy Roman Empire lasts? 1806. And we'll come back to them, of course. But the Holy Roman Empire, again, because it was, so you had the, the kingdom ruled by a king, but then there was an emperor elected to be over all the kingdoms within the empire. But the empire itself couldn't tax you. Only your king could tax you. So the empire couldn't, in a sense, establish a standing army. So it didn't have the same kind of authority structure as the Roman Empire in Constantinople or the king of France did, right? He could tax his nobles directly or the king of England who could tax his nobles, right? Um, and so the structure of this empire was, was different. Um, but the vision of it, right, was to, in a sense, reestablish or reassert the Western part of the Roman Empire, in a sense. And the, and Otto, the Ottos wanted co connection with the, the, the um, emperors in Constantinople. Because, again, you would have an emperor in the east and you would have an emperor in the west, going back to the time of Diocletian. And thereafter, the empire had been divided. And so, in some sense, you, could th you can understand how they wanted to frame themselves as being the western part of the Roman Empire. And there being this eastern part um, as well. Again, it's only until the Renaissance, not the Renaissance, but the Enlightenment period, that we start talking about a Byzantine Empire. That just, that's a modern term created to distinguish the Roman Empire based in Constantinople from the Roman Empire anywhere else, when it was based somewhere else. Still the Roman Empire, though. Um, and so... What, what emerges, though, is the understanding of authority of king and bishop. Where does the authority of the, of the monarch come from? And where does the authority of the bishop come from, in a sense? Um, so... Temporal authority or royal authority um, was in Constantinople was one distinct thing. And then the authority of sometimes it's called the sacerdotal authority or the priestly authority, right? The authority of the church, right? Was it's was was a different authority. Um, and so in Constantinople and in the East, the understanding was there was supposed to be a symphony between these authorities, that they worked together in a symphony, right, in harmony with one another. Um, but the understanding is the, the authority of the king was directly from God, just like David in the Old Testament. God anointed him king through Samuel, but it was the authority of kingship was from God. It didn't come to the king, in a sense, through the church. The priestly authority didn't grant the kingly authority. It came directly from God. And the priestly authority, or authority of the bishops in the church, came directly from God. And they were to work in harmony with one another. But because the emperor was to manage the temporal affairs of his kingdom, he had a say in what went on, with the organization of the church, in a sense, of how it was organized, who the bishops were going to be, and so forth. And this understanding was universal, pretty much throughout uh, East and West, where you had the kings having a say in who was going to be the bishop, or even the abbot of a monastery. Um, because the king was the head of 
the Christian nation. And his authority as king came directly from God. And he was in charge of ordering justly the kingdom. And so therefore he had a say in who was the, you know, the, the appointment of the bishops. And this is what we saw with the Bishop of Rome asking the approval of the emperor in Constantinople in the time period um, of the seven to eight hundreds, where you have the um, uh, the uh, what we call the they call it the Byzantine popes. Um, Anna Marie, get the power thing and we've got to plug this thing in. Um, so So the principle of all spiritual and temporal authority in the Christian tradition is Christ himself. Can you plug it in over there? You can squeeze by me. I don't want the computer to die on us here. Um, royal authority in the Eastern Roman Empire was retained by king. And again, the king was also seen like Moses. He's the lawgiver. He has this kind of mosaic um, function in some way as the lawgiver. Thank you, Anna Marie. And the priestly or sacerdotal authority is, is granted to the bishops and through the bishops to the priests. Um, and this is the role of Aaron or Samuel, in some sense, compared. Um, now, in Christ, both king and priestly authority is assumed in himself, because Christ is both king, king and priest, high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. But in but in the but in the church, the bishop does not possess kingly authority; he only possesses priestly authority he shares in christ's high priesthood he doesn't possess it as something of his own okay and the king receives his authority as king from god this is the this is the understanding at the time so this meant that the royal authority now i'm, I'm reading to you a quote from philip sherard his book the greek east and the latin west a study in christian tradition um He says, this meant that the royal authority of the emperor, regarded by the episcopate itself um, as of divine origin. The bishops considered the authority of the king as being of divine origin, it coming from God, and extended over the official exoteric or the external tradition of the church, was practically speaking absolute. The bishops having authority in the connection only to the point of seeing that the faith of which the emperor sought to bind his subjects was the right faith. So basically, it's the bishop's job to make sure that the faith of the emperor is the right faith. But then it's the emperor who's organizing society around the right faith in terms of the organization of law and justice. And the today working of markets, economics, all of those things. That these are justly uh, organized around the right, the right faith. What happens in the West, though, is something different. And this is, again, Philip, Philip Sherrard. Um, the Pope's claim to primacy, the attempt to end the conflict and tension that had resulted from the separation of power between the bishops and the emperor during the Byzantine period, meaning the period where the popes, this Byzantine period of popes, where the popes would go and seek the approval of the emperor, and also then after that period, the iconoclast period that was rather disruptive in the empire. Um, the problems that ar arose from iconoclasm from the emperor imposing on the church, in a sense, a false faith, right? The Bishop of Rome, his attempt to solve that problem 
right? Was to establish by was by establishing the papacy as the supreme source of both spiritual and temporal, meaning sacerdotal and royal authority on earth. And by compelling the emperor to accept the principle that his authority derives not directly from God, but from the Pope. And this is then why, this is, this is all rooted then, this understanding works itself out. One, from Charlemagne being crowned emperor, and since Pope Leo III, Pope Leo III claiming the right to choose the emperor. Because he gave the title of emperor to Charlemagne. It came from the pope, even though the pope then, then in a sense, did uh, honored him or prostrated himself before the emperor after he gave him the authority. No other pope ever will do that again. Otto I is crowned again emperor by John XII, meaning from the pope, the authority of emperor is given to a man. It's not understood in the West as coming directly from God, but now coming through the Pope to the king. And therefore, the Pope is a, an authority above the king. In a sense, not a, not a spiritual authority that is equivalent to a temp, the temporal authority of the king. In a sense, they, not that they, they aren't equals in a sense. But one is superior to the other. They each in in, in in Constantinople, the king, the emperor, and the bishops, right, were 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 they had their own area of authority, one spiritual and one temporal. And they could give input to the other, but they weren't able to step into the other's authority and and um, administer it themselves. And neither of them saw their authority coming from the other. Does it make sense? Whereas in the West, what emerges from Charlemagne, and then it develops onward now, especially with Otto I, the Holy Roman Empire, the temporal authority is coming not from God directly, but from the Bishop of Rome. And so the Bishop of Rome becomes this elevated figure above even the kings. And this... this um, tension this uh, between the emperors, the kings, and the, and the Pope of Rome will be the main kind of arena of conflict in some sense, in controversy, um, in shenanigans, you might say, for the rest of the Middle Ages. But it is a novel. It is a novel and new idea and way of structuring society that emerges in the Middle Ages and takes root by the 11th and 12th century in the West. Um, and then, of course, the Reformation will be a rejection, uh, first of papal authority, and then the revolutions of France and America, as well as communism and so forth, is a, is a rejection of the concept of divine, in a sense, authority coming to the king. So, but we'll get there. And which pope was that that claimed that authority? Well, Pope Leo the Third, what pope, the first pope to kind of claim this idea that he could make an emperor is Leo the Third. Um, in eight hundred. Um, but then this will be, in a sense, reasserted, kind of will ebb and flow and will reassert itself now under Otto I um, and for going forward. And it becomes this tension when we get to Gregory uh, the Seventh, I think it is, um, Hildebrand is, his, is another his, his other name. Um, these are the Gregorian reforms of the 11th century. This is where the ideas of this, this, these kind of things are firmly asserted. The Pope's authority over temporal and spiritual spheres kind of become dogmatized in the Catholic Church at that point. And this is post-schism, post-1054. That's 1074, that these things are starting to be asserted. 
But this is where, but in terms of where this conflict is emerging, it's a different concept of the structure of society that is emerging. Um, now, uh, and that we're still kind of living with the ramifications of in many ways, especially because the, there is the, in a sense, the, the backlash to it, right, is, is we're living in the, the kind of the, the final logical uh, ends of that backlash today. So um, of, the, of, 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 of this assertion of authority kind of reaching too far and then a rejection of it, kind of these things move through history slowly often. So um, this is where we're going. But this also sets the foundation, this, this idea of the Pope's authority will set this foundation for a further division and the greater split east and west on, uh, going forward. So any questions? All right. God bless you. We will not have class next week. We have festival prep all week. So we are not going to have a class next Wednesday night. We'll come back and uh, in two weeks, on Wednesday in two weeks, we will talk about the Great Schism of 1054. So good night.